Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Nick Sitar, and I'm going to introduce the speaker today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome our web viewers as well as the audience here. Uh, I also would like to remind everybody that at noon uh, we will have another presentation about uh, smart grid and renewable energy by Terry Mon, Chief Information of Innovation Officer for Balance Energy. So please uh, keep that uh, in your mind. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce the speaker today, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hausler. Um, Elizabeth uh, has an undergraduate degree uh, in civil engineering from the University of Illinois. And then after practicing and, uh, for a number of years, she came to Berkeley uh, for her PhD. I had the privilege to be her PhD supervisor. Uh, just for the record, he, her PhD was on ground improvement nothing to do with uh, a lot of what she has done since. Uh, what she has done since, after, right after graduation, she won a Fulbright Award, uh, went to India to, with the mission to learn about indigenous uh, construction practices and to see how the construction practices in uh, hazard-prone areas could be uh, improved uh, with local technologies um, uh, so that lives could be saved. Uh, on the heels of that, uh, came the uh, tsunami and earthquake in Indonesia, and she got involved in Banda Aceh uh, as a volunteer initially, and then eventually uh, she founded her own nonprofit organization called Build Change. She's the CEO, and uh, for her work with Build Change, she got involved in Indonesia, then later on in Sichuan, uh, more recently in Haiti. Uh, she has uh, won a number of awards. She has been the 2004 Echoing Green Fellow, 2006 Draper Richards Fellow, 2009 Ashoka Lemerson Fellow, and uh, uh, her trajectory is uh, on the up. I also would like to remind that she made the Forefront uh, magazine cover uh, a year ago, so uh, she's quite well known to us, and it's a real pleasure uh, to have her. And there is one, one other thing I'd like to say. Uh, before she starts. Uh, you know, uh, we, we often get involved in, as engineers in teamwork, and the question becomes, uh, can one person make a difference? And uh, I think Elizabeth is an example of how one person can make a difference. So it's a real pleasure to have her here. Please, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm really humbled by that introduction. I mean, it's it's been an amazing it's been an amazing journey to be able to do this work, but it's definitely been a team effort, and so there have been a lot more people involved in what Build Change has done, um, other than me. So, so Build Change, like Nick said, is a nonprofit social enterprise. Um, it's I started it in 2004, and what we do is design earthquake resistant houses and train builders, engineers, and government officials uh, to build them. So we don't actually build houses for people, but rather build the capacity to build safe houses in post-earthquake environments. So, so far we work in Indonesia, China, and Haiti, and so far our work has improved over 6,400 permanent houses and more than 11,000 transitional or temporary houses. So there are about 72,000 people globally living in houses that are better because of our work. We've trained about 4,000 builders and homeowners, engineers, government officials, and the building guidelines that we've developed are being used by um, local governments in Indonesia and China. So, but how did, how did we get started? I was a PhD student here at Berkeley doing some very interesting research on ground improvement to prevent liquefaction. I, I had the pleasure of doing centrifuge tests in at UC Davis and at the Public Works Research Insti Institute in Japan and some very exciting blast-induced liquefaction research in Hokkaido in Japan. Um, but when I was about halfway through this work, there was an earthquake in India that killed about 20,000 people. And this was the first earthquake that really got my attention in terms of looking at how many people are actually killed in earthquakes in developing countries. You know, there aren't that many deaths in earthquakes in developed countries. There certainly is a lot of economic losses, but the number of deaths is usually a lot lower. So why are so many people still killed in developing countries? Well, it's not the earthquake, as I'm sure you've all heard before. It's not the earthquake that kills people. It's a poorly built building poorly designed and poorly built building. That was certainly the case in Gujarat, where there was a lot of unreinforced masonry with very heavy roofs. 
I worked for my father as a bricklayer growing up outside of Chicago, so I had some practical skills and decided to um, try to see what I could do in this field, so I went to Indiana Fulbright Fellowship. And I went primarily to look at, do people build earthquake-resistant houses after an earthquake? And is the opportunity to change construction practice really leveraged um, so that people continue to build safe houses in the future? And I looked at what happened in 1993 after the earthquake in eastern Maharashtra state, where generally the government and donors came in with significant amounts of funding and they hired contractors and they designed and built the houses themselves, the same house for almost every homeowner, didn't really involve the homeowner in the process. And what you got in that case was you, you, you got the same house for everyone. So homeowners that had larger families or wanted to extend, they would just build an unreinforced masonry wall butted up against the existing building. And this isn't so good for earthquakes. There's no structural integrity there. And you also had organizations, clever architects, coming in with alternative technologies. Like this is a dome building, which is very good for earthquakes, but extremely poor in terms of light, ventilation, privacy, ability to divide the interior space. And what happened when people wanted to extend the building, they went back to the old way of building, unreinforced masonry. So because this different technology was brought in, the opportunity to work with people to build something that they were familiar with and improve upon a common technology was really missed. And I also found in this environment where the contractors were building the houses and the homeowners were really not involved, the homeowners didn't trust that their structure was safe because they weren't there to check that the concrete was mixed properly and there was enough cement in the mortar. And as a result, even 10 years after the earthquake, people were sleeping outside because they didn't, they didn't believe their structure was going to remain intact in an earthquake. So this is an interesting history in India because the government learned a lot of lessons after that earthquake in 1993. And by the time Gujarat came around in 2001, the government had an idea, well, we're going to give the funds to the homeowners and empower them to drive the process themselves. So they gave people a choice. You could build yourself with funding from the government and some technical assistance. The funding was given out in installments and you couldn't get the next installment unless you built according to a very simple standard issued by the government. Um, or you could build, go the old-fashioned route and hire a contractor with an NGO and build that way. And the majority of homeowners chose to go through the process themselves, right? And they didn't really build the house themselves. They hired a contractor, a small-scale builder, to do it. But they really drove the process. They could choose the architecture. They could choose the materials. And what you had were much more satisfied homeowners because they were bought into the process they could add in their own funds so they could build a bigger system or a bigger courtyard area, something that suited their lifestyle. And the standard that was, was implemented was simple to follow. You could, build mas you could build brick masonry, you could build stone masonry, concrete block masonry. As long as you followed the reinforcement guidelines, you could get the funding. And to the extent people followed the guidelines, the houses were fairly earthquake resistant. So this process actually leads to more homeowner buy-in, a more satisfied homeowner, and if the technical assistance is there, a structure that's sufficiently earthquake resistant. So now in Gujarat, though, there are a lot of houses that were built the old way without the homeowners really involved. And so you had some organizations designing houses with the toilet inside. Well, the homeowner wanted the toilet outside. And so what happens? The homeowner doesn't use the toilet. The, the, the toilets that's built in the house. Um, and, and it's wasted space, and you have, a, you have a health issue because there's no adequate water and sanitation. You had other organizations designing houses that weren't appropriate for the climate. Very earthquake resistant, small buildings with small openings, but not so good for air circulation in a very hot desert environment that is Gujarat. And then you also had new developments award-winning architectural designs that were un unoccupied, completely abandoned because there was no infrastructure, no water, um, and no electricity, and no jobs. So people didn't live in those houses. So I came away, um, sorry. So there were also organizations in 
in Gujarat who tried to introduce alternative, more environmentally friendly technologies. And to me, personally, these, these technologies are quite appealing. I mean, the, they're very comfortable to be in. Um, but the problem was the homeowners didn't really like these types of houses. They actually preferred confined masonry, a masonry, a masonry system. So despite all these great efforts to introduce these technologies, they didn't really take off in the private sector. People wanted confined masonry, and so by training people to build with these other technologies, they missed the opportunity again to work with people to build something that was locally appropriate. Um, and there were some, there are still some engineering challenges with these types of technologies, the compressed stabilized earth block and the stabilized rammed earth. Trying to design these types of technologies in, in a seismic environment has kind of compelled people to put reinforced concrete elements in these types of buildings. And a lot of the buildings that I saw when I was there had small cracks because of the difference in the stiffnesses and the expansion properties of the earth-based material versus reinforced concrete. And certainly these, these issues can be overcome. But the other challenge was kind of an economic one where Agencies came in and donated the materials and the equipment needed to build with these technologies, a block press and the forms for the um, stabilized rammed earth. This material, the, the capital cost of the equipment was so high that the, your average builder really wouldn't invest in that equipment, so the technology wouldn't take off. Plus, there is no demand for it because the homeowners really preferred another technology. So, in during this process of doing this research in India, I kind of came up with a lot of ideas about how not to go about post-earthquake reconstructions, but also developed a list of criteria for the house itself, for the house to be safe, for it to be earthquake resistant, for the homeowner to be satisfied, and for the whole process to be sustainable. And by sustainable, I mean people continue to build safe houses um, after an earthquake. And so I came into this problem looking, looking at it like an engineer, thinking it was just a technical problem, and it certainly is. The structure has to be earthquake resistant in both the design and you have to be able to build it in a way that's earthquake resistant. It should be expandable with materials that are locally available. It has to be durable. It should be resistant to other disasters besides just earthquakes. We're working in Haiti now. I'll tell you more about that later, but we're definitely looking at strong winds there. Um, but there are a lot of economic factors that you have to consider as well. The cost has to be competitive with the common vulnerable way of building. So if you come in with something that's too expensive, people are not going to build it. And the skills and materials have to be available locally. Not necessarily sourced locally, but available locally for the technology to really last in the long term. And ideally, resources are conserved in the process. On the social side, the structure has to be appropriate for the climate and the culture. It's got to have architecture that's satisfactory, otherwise people will modify it. There are organizations who built houses with the door on the street. People wanted the door in the courtyard. So what did they do? Well, they bashed a hole in the wall, which is not so good for the earthquake resistance of the building, and blocked in another one in a way that really wasn't um, um, earthquake resistant. So the house has to be maintainable with the skills and materials that people have locally. And one of the most important things, people have to trust that the house is going to keep their family safe in an earthquake. Otherwise, they're not going to live in it and they're going to move on. So, so it occurred to me at this point that this is not just a technical problem. It's like so many development challenges, <clears throat> excuse me, so many challenges in developing countries. It's not just a technical issue and it's not just a money issue and it's not just a, a people issue, it's all three combined. So you've got to get the technology right, but if the technology is too expensive, people are not going to implement it. And someone ultimately has to want a house to be earthquake resistant. So this can be the homeowner, it can be the government, or <coughs> excuse me, it can be an agency or a donor, but someone has to want to build the house safely. So. So after this research, I started Build Change, um, and we started our first program in Aceh after the tsunami. We did a pilot project. Our, our idea wasn't that we were going to build houses for people. We wanted to train people to build them. But we went ahead and did that in Aceh, and it was a great exercise, because going through the process of actually building houses ourselves made us really understand what it takes to do that. Um, so we started out looking at what technology is already common, because it's so much easier to make small changes to existing technologies 
rather than to bring in something completely new. And one of the most, one of the two common ways of building houses in Indonesia, in rural areas, single family homes, is confined masonry. Confined masonry, it's a masonry load bearing shear wall system. So you build the foundation with a reinforced concrete foundation beam, and then you build the masonry wall. And then after you build the wall, you cast the concrete for the columns so that you get a good connection between the columns, between the tie columns and the wall. And then after you finish building the wall, then you cast on the ring beam. And so we applied some very simple, um, a very simple philosophy towards improving this system, which we call the three C's. Um, configuration is the first C. So a very simple symmetric layout strategically placed windows, and a lightweight roof. The second C, connections. Everything has to be connected together properly for the building to perform well in an earthquake. So emphasizing connections between um, the reinforced concrete tie columns and bond beams, looking at connections between the um, wall and the column. We put reinforcement in the bed joint of the masonry, tying that into the column, and connecting the roof down to um, the wall system. And the third C, construction quality. We strongly emphasized every step of the way to do good quality construction. So a confined masonry building, the first line of defense in an earthquake is a strong wall. You've got to build a good quality masonry wall. And in Indonesia, the bricks are not very strong. They're fired in open, in rural kilns, usually fired by wood or rice husk. The temperature in the kiln is not very high. So the blocks aren't really very, the bricks aren't very strong. And it's also extremely hot there. So if you lay the brick dry, then the brick is so porous that it will absorb the water out, out of the mortar before the cement has time to hydrate and create a good bond between the bricks and the mortar. But if you soak the bricks in water before you build the wall, this, it, in, we've done some very simple tests in our, in our field office, just laying bricks dry and laying bricks wet and, and testing the model in flexure. And we see four times the strength if you lay the bricks wet than if you lay them dry. So this is a very simple, very simple technique that you can do to, to see a really large increase in the strength of the wall. Um, and water in Indonesia is not that difficult to come by. You just need a few buckets, and it's very easy to look at. So, so a little bit later, I'm going to talk a bit more about the structural engineering design work. But a lot of what Build Change has done and what we inform people about is based on observing how buildings perform after earthquakes. There's so many earthquakes in Indonesia. We've had the opportunity to look at a lot of different buildings. And it kind of becomes obvious. You see the same problems over and over. A very tall, slender wall, which fails out of plane. Inadequate connections between tie columns and bond beams. Um, walls that fail in shear because they're just not strong enough and there's too many openings to resist um, the earthquake forces. So, so once we built some of these houses ourselves, our model was we wanted to go much bigger. We wanted to have an impact on a lot more houses. So we shared all of these resources with some other larger agencies like CARE and Oxfam and Catholic Relief Services to, do, um, to design their houses, to train their staff, to ins inspect buildings for them um, and provide the surface as sort of an engineering consultant. So and even though Build Change is a nonprofit, we actually operate a little bit like an engineering consultancy and earn some, earn some profit off of that. It goes back into our general funds, but that's how we offset some of our costs. So we spend, like I said before, we spend a lot of time on construction quality to try to, try to work with the builders to improve the way they build. Here you can see a house built by some of the builders we worked with versus houses built by some of the other agencies. Same thing here. Very poor um, quality uh, reinforced concrete construction there in the, co in the corner. So we started to do these, these massive capacity building programs. And we trained builders in four months, apprenticeship type training programs. We found that our best staff were graduates of, not necessarily engineering graduates, but graduates of construction trade schools. And so we started doing training programs at these, at these construction trade schools. Then we wrapped things up in Aceh and moved to West Sumatra, where there are some other lower profile earthquakes in 2007, which you may not have heard about. 
Um, but we continue to provide the same kind of hands-on technical assistance. The guys on the right in these pictures are our staff sitting down with the builder and the home and a carpenter going over good timber joinery and good masonry construction. What we found then, as we evolved our work in West Sumatra, was that a lot of people were building out of timber frame. So we developed additional training resources for the structural system. It's a simple timber frame building with a masonry skirt wall. Um, a lot of the joinery is very cleverly done to avoid use, the use of nails. There are diagonal bracing in the corner, and this upper wall is, was traditionally made out of a bamboo, woven bamboo mat, but that bamboo was harder to come by and took longer to make, and as, as things evolved, people switched to using a chain-link fence for the upper wall. Um, they would plat put a backing board on one side and plaster it, and then take that off and plaster the other side. And the finished building actually looks quite like a masonry structure, very modern. And so as people continue to experience earthquakes in Indonesia, they're actually going back to building this more traditional type of structure of timber frame with a masonry skirt wall. So another interesting thing that, that we discovered in this whole process was when we were empowering the homeowners to build themselves, they got a very small grant from the Indonesian government the cost per house of the materials, labor, and our technical assistance was a lot lower than the same house built in Aceh where donors were really driving the process and they had very high overhead costs and, they, and, and not as good of control on the materials. When a homeowner is really driving the process, they don't waste materials, they tend to recycle more materials, and so the overall materials consumption is less in this model, and we can stretch donors' dollars further by really working with the homeowner and empowering them to make those choices. So, then there was another earthquake in Indonesia, in the same place we were working in September of 2009. None of the homes that we worked with people to build uh, to our minimum standard had any damage in this earthquake. And what we found going back to some of these areas that we hadn't been in in six or eight months, we found new homeowners building houses with some of the same techniques that we were promoting without, without our assistance, just with their own money. And that's kind of the big long-term change that we're really going for. Okay, so um, we also at that point started mass marketing information because we realized we had a limited staff Working one-on-one -on -one with each homeowner is definitely helpful, but how can we get these messages out to massive numbers of people? So we developed these, these kind of technical resources. And this one on the left is, if you can just do these six things on your confined masonry house, it will be much safer than it was if you didn't. So things like not using masonry in the gable wall, using confining elements, connecting them together, building a strong wall by soaking the bricks in water. And if you use large openings at the front of your house, which is very common in Indonesia, just put some reinforcement over it. So trying to make things, trying to kind of demystify earthquake engineering and, and, and make the, the techniques that people need to use to build safely accessible to everyone. Okay, so, um, so we, we're still operating in Indonesia, and after the 2008 earthquake in, in Wenchuan in China, we opened a program in China. So I'm going to kind of a little bit more systematically now go through the build change process and the design process that we've used um, to rebuild houses. And it always starts with learning. So um, why did houses collapse and why did they not? Um, you, there are always great examples of buildings that did not collapse in earthquakes. This is an example from Sichuan. Um, these were some older, um, unreinforced or partially confined masonry buildings with precast concrete plank roofs, which were all in piles of rubble. In the back, you had a two-story confined masonry building built according to the 2006 code and a simple unreinforced single-story building, um, which both, both building types did very well in the earthquake. So we have a series of, of reconnaissance reports that we did on this earthquake, which are available on our website. Um, but you know, we went through to kind of try to think about, well, why did buildings collapse and why did they not? And the, one of the primary reasons is the use of this precast concrete plank roof on an unreinforced or poorly confined masonry wall. And it turns out that this technology was actually allowable in China in the 90s. Um, it was written up in some conference papers. But you can see there's no real connection between the uh, precast concrete plank and the ring beam. Um, so this is a very vulnerable system 
in an earthquake, and it's now actually banned in, in most of China. Um, so again, without doing any structural engineering, we can pretty much make a recommendation that these, these planks aren't a good idea in an earthquake prone area. But we can't just come out and say, well, don't do this without giving people some alternatives. So recommending to use reinforced concrete cast in place roofs or timber um, were, were, was the alternative. So there are a lot of single story buildings also in rural areas in China that had a lot of damage. And they were classic sheer failures of masonry walls. And these are caused by poor quality masonry, not enough cement in the mortar, poor bonding between bricks and mortar, the same kind of problems that we see over and over. So we can, again, make recommendations easily without doing any structural engineering about how to improve these buildings. Um, use, higher, use higher strength bricks, make sure the mixed proportion is correct. Um, make sure there's a good bond between the bricks and the mortar. Um, use a thicker wall and add confinement. So. Um, the beauty of confined masonry is that it adds ductility. So if you have a masonry wall that cracks, if you have it confined by reinforced concrete columns and beams, there's extra, there's an extra ability to dissipate energy and to prevent the building from collapsing because it can crack a little bit without and still remain confined by the reinforced concrete columns and beams. So. Um, it's interesting, though, in all of these earthquake areas, you find a lot of unreinforced masonry buildings that did just fine. And you know, we don't want to recommend unreinforced masonry because it's a building with very little reserve capacity. Once it cracks, um, you're in big trouble. But it kind of says something about the, about the need to build a strong masonry wall. And if you build a strong masonry wall and you follow simple rules on configuration and that sort of thing, you'll be a lot better off um, than not doing so. So we found a lot of unreinforced masonry buildings that also failed out of plane, basically one, one wall failing and usually overturning. And again, simple solutions to improve that type of failure, put confining elements, use confined masonry, use reinforced concrete tie columns and beams and tie everything together. Um, again, over and over, earthquake after earthquake, vulnerable masonry gable walls. So we're trying to get people to just avoid those altogether. So um, by using timber or using a hipped roof, we also found a lot of um, damage in lintel areas because people didn't use a lintel beam. So getting at the minimum, a 24 centimeter extension into the wall, but ideally a lintel beam that goes all the way across. So once we finish this forensic engineering, we go through and do what we call a housing subsector study to understand what types of houses people build here and now. Not what type did they build 20 years ago, but what is the commonly preferred architecture, what materials are available, where do people buy them, how much do they cost, who builds, who produces the materials, how can we, where, where are the points where we can enter the process and improve the construction? Once we do that, we actually do go through a structural engineering analysis. We've hired structural engineers from Berkeley, and now we're outsourcing a bunch of the structural engineering design work for Haiti to um, some of the firms from here in the Bay Area. And you know, it's just like a standard design. You go through and look at what codes apply, what material properties need to apply, what are the architectural considerations. It's a very kind of um, holistic approach. So. Um, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through this, but I want to give you some idea of the kind of structural engineering issues uh, that we came across when we were trying to do this analysis. So we used two different methods. Um, we first looked at in-plane shear. And so looking at in-plane shear, you first have to decide what is a shear wall, right? And we decided we would include only the walls that had confinement on both ends, right? So, so this wall, this segment of wall, we wouldn't include because it wasn't confined on both ends. So that's one assumption. And then we, we only included walls that didn't have opening. So we didn't include those walls that didn't qualify as shear walls as part of our analysis. And to look at demand, we used ASCE7 equivalent lateral force method. And then capacity, we used FEMA 306 equation 8.10 according to the US codes. We also did analysis according to the China codes. And what we found in both cases was a very conservative result. The US code said that we needed 5.5% shear wall density. And that's, that's very large, larger than what's recommended by some of the other guidelines that are out there, larger than what we, we see. 
in, in earthquake performance. So we decided to try some other ways of computing the shear wall density using AS, ACI 530 and got a more, what we thought was a more realistic result. But we're still, we can still only get so far with the structural engineering analysis. And we were wondering if this was conservative because it doesn't, con it doesn't include the contribution of the confining elements. It doesn't include the walls that aren't shear walls. It, 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 it calculates the strength of the wall based on just the strength of the mortar and the brick. And that doesn't really represent how the masonry wall itself as a whole performs. But this is as far as we can get with the code-based analysis. So what we really need to do is, is research and experimental testing here to get to, to kind of bridge that gap um, between where you can get with a code-based design and what is really sufficiently earthquake resistant to be built in the field and um, affordable. So we also looked at out-of-plane because out-of-plane is always a big issue that catches the attention um, of engineers when they're looking at um, unreinforced masonry buildings. We first looked at just horizon the horizontal span, so just if the wall is, is, is bending like that, and, re and, and realized if we just looked at the strength from horizontal spanning, it was way too conservative. Um, the same thing with the vertical spanning. Um, again, we got that there was insufficient capacity, but if you consider that this wall is actually more like, uh, more like a shell, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an unreinforced masonry wall that's confined on all four sides, so it acts more like a shell, then you actually get um, that there is sufficient capacity if you look at it that way. If you confine it, so if you have reinforced concrete plinth beam, if you have a reinforced concrete ring beam, if you have reinforced concrete tie columns on all four sides, basically for this wall to fail, you'd have to have the foundation settle, you'd have to have the ring beam heave, or you'd have to have so much crushing in the mortar or the bricks so that the wall could, could bow out like a shell for it to fail. And the thing is, we've actually never, I've never seen a wall fail like this. Um, a fully confined wall confined masonry, confined on both sides with no openings. I've never seen a wall fail like that unless the perpendicular wall has already failed and the wall overturns. So what we're most concerned about with out-of-plane failure is a rigid overturning. And so if you can keep the perpendicular wall from failing in plane, again, going back to building a strong masonry wall, and you can tie everything together um, so there's no likelihood of failing out of plane, that's the way to go. We looked at the tie columns to check tension. Um, we also, I'm going to skip through this to save time, looked at the ring beam. Um, of course, we checked the foundation for uplift and shear transfer and for um, bearing capacity and for a single story building. We basically determined, well, if we didn't have liquefiable soils or expansive clays, we were probably in good shape. So we did some very simple screening tests in the field, looked at the roof to design um, the reinforcement for that. And then at the end, we had a design for a house that we were satisfied with, but our end goal is not to design one floor plan and build it for everyone, but to instead design a set of design rules so that the homeowner can really choose the type of house they want. So instead, we came up with a shear wall density requirement. We came up with where the columns should be located. We came up with the size of the steel and the connection detailing and the detailing for the roof and a set of design rules rather than a, 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 a design itself. We were also able then to go through and do some simple cost estimates so we could estimate how much, what is the cost per um, square meter. Now, we are working in the field, rural areas, not a lot of testing equipment. So we also try to develop simple methods for testing materials quality. Um, so what would you do if you were out in the field and you wanted to determine if you had too much mud in your sand without a lab? Anyone? So one of the things that we do is just mix it up with some water and look at how cloudy the water is. I mean, it's not ideal. But you're out in the field, you don't have a lab, and you've got to do something. The same thing with bricks. So how can we determine if the brick is strong enough? Well, we can do a little three-point bending test with an average size 
person to see what percentage of the bricks actually break and what, what they don't. So we're trying to further refine some of these methods to partner with research institutes so that we can calibrate what we do. Um, but it's key to be able to determine these kind of properties in the field. Okay, so the next step once we finish all the engineering design is to build local capacity. So Build Change's philosophy is to hire and train local professionals um, who then go out into the rural areas and do the training programs. And so this is, this is our team in China. So we've got a construction engineer, a structural engineer, a material specialist, um, an architect, a translator, and all of those people who come from academics or the construction sector who join our team, we work together to design and build safe houses and leave in place that capacity. So the next thing, again, we've got to convince someone to build an earthquake-resistant house. Someone has to want the house to be safe. So if, we don't, if we're not working in an environment in which building code enforcement is likely, then we have to go to the homeowner. So we do these simple training programs for homeowners, start out talking about why the buildings collapsed. And we found in China, um, the homeowners were signing simple contracts with builders but they were very technical and they were not complete. So we went through and reviewed them and created a template which contained a complete contract and also explained things that weren't very clear, like it referred to different strengths of concrete but in very technical terms. So we broke those down into the number of bags of cement, the number of wheelbarrows of sand, and the number of wheelbarrows of gravel so that the average homeowner could check the mixed proportion to, to make sure that they were getting a strength that was pretty close to what was required. So and then we sat down with each homeowner. These are our staff here, and these are homeowners, and asked them, well, what type of house do you want to build? And how do you like to draw the house? Two bedrooms, um, kitchen, and sat down with each homeowner to draw a floor plan that they really liked. At the same time, because we'd done a cost estimate, we, we could back of envelope calculate how much it costs to build the house and work with the homeowner within their budget. So if they didn't have enough money to build the big house that they wanted, we, we would be able to change that before they start construction. Because the last thing we want is for them, homeowners, to start building a house, invest a lot of money in the foundation, get to the top of the wall, and they're not able to complete the very important tie column um, bond beam connections. So, so this is one of the first uh, women that we worked with in China. Her name is Xing Dayan. And she had started building her house before we entered her village. So she had one wall that was going up very out of plumb. She also put a window and a door right together at the back of our house. So we talked her through what she needed to do to improve that building. Tear down the wall that wasn't straight and put reinforcement over the window and door combination. We didn't give her any money or any materials, just advice. And she was able to get her contractor to do exactly what she wanted done. And then she told us that all of her neighbors wanted reinforcements over their window and door openings. So this, this is the kind of change that we love to make. Get the homeowner to really understand what needs to be done, have them take care of it themselves, their neighbors see it, and change happens. Okay, so, but wouldn't it be easier if the government would just enforce building standards? Yes, absolutely it would, um, but it's not always cor a corruption issue. What we find in a lot of areas that we work with, especially in rural areas, there's just a lack of capacity. There aren't enough engineers, there aren't enough people who are trained in engineering, there aren't enough vehicles, there isn't enough budget to get around to see each homeowner. So after we started working for a while in China, the government, the township government asked us to inspect houses on their behalf. So we trained our staff they would go out and not really inspect, not really just kind of show up and, and write down on a list and go back, but really work hand in hand with the builder and the homeowner to improve the way they were building. Report, we would report back to the Chinese government and they would, they would provide incentives for the contractors who were doing a good job and um, give the contractors who were not, not doing such a good job, um, calling them into the office and asking them to improve the way they built. built. So we also decided that we should share our knowledge and resources with government officials, and so we started doing government officials training, which we're now doing in a larger scale in China. We developed, again, similar marketing materials that show, show a poor quality wall and show, show a poor quality wall and show a good quality wall. Um, again, for the concrete mixing, breaking it down into the number of bags of cement, wheelbarrows of sand, and wheelbarrows of gravel so that so that it's easy and simple for anyone to understand how to build an earthquake resistant house. And money, we need to talk about money because that's always, that's always a factor. 
Um, in China, the government provided a grant to the homeowners, so they had the minimum that they needed to build an earthquake-resistant house. Okay, so um, we are also working in Haiti. Um, we've just started working there, and again, started with the same process of understanding why houses collapse in earthquakes and why they don't going through the same exact process of understanding what materials and technology are locally available um, in order to design houses that people really want to build and live in. And what we found on my first trip to Haiti in March, um, this is a group of local residents in Leogan, which is near the epicenter, slightly outside of Port-au-Prince. They had started building um, a new building after the earthquake to get a water treatment facility back online. And they were already taking measures and making steps to make their building more earthquake resistant. They were building unreinforced masonry before. This is confined masonry. It's not perfect. I mean, there's a lot of issues with this picture. I mean, you can see they didn't cast the concrete all in one go and left the, left the joint open there. But they were so interested in information about how to build better. And they were already using their own funds to build better. So we see the same thing in Indonesia and in China and Haiti everywhere very different economies, very different cultures. But the average homeowner wants information about how to build safely. And if we can make it simple enough for, for everyone to understand and not too expensive, then people will change the way they're building. So that's what we're on the path to doing that again in Haiti. Um, we're going through the design process now. Like I mentioned earlier, we're outsourc outsourcing to some of the structural engineering firms here um, and in New York, going through and doing a, oops, wrong way, doing, um, doing structural engineering design for uh, confined masonry, for reinforced masonry, for a timber frame building, and for a multiple story, multiple use building, um, which will likely be reinforced concrete frame with masonry infill. Um, and then going through the same process of supply and demand. With earthquake resistant construction, you have to have a sufficient capacity, engineers, builders, uh, technical supervisors who understand how to design and build a safe house. And so we are, um, we are hiring, oh, I'm skipping around here a little bit. So we've hired uh, our local team. Again, the same kind of construction professionals. These two guys are work, work for Build Change. This is a homeowner training um, that we, uh, one of the first ones that we've done in Haiti. And at the same time, we're developing simple resources, a set of technical resources. Again, the masonry wall is so important if you're building confined masonry. So the first line of defense is building a strong masonry wall. So we start out um, with, with resources that improve this type of construction. Technical ones as well as more simple ones um, that appeal to the homeowners. And, um, and we're just starting builders training as well. So in our training programs, we, we show good steel detailing as well as as, as constant messaging about the quality of the masonry wall. It's also really important to get the steel connected together correctly, um, make sure the stirrups have hooks, make sure the hooks are rotated, that sort of thing. And one of our first training courses, we had this little girl who came with her mom. And during the course of the training, she drew the steel model. And I just thought that was so great because it means that you know, our, our, we're simplifying our message messages in such a way that they're accessible to everyone. So. So that's basically what Build Change does, is, trying, is building local capacity to build earthquake-resistant houses and trying to simplify earthquake engineering so everyone can understand how to build an earthquake-resistant house. So we're continuing our programs in Indonesia, expanding in the area that was affected by the 2009 earthquakes, providing hands-on technical assistance. In China, we're wrapping up the reconstruction following the 2008 earthquakes and shifting more to pre-earthquake mitigation, so training uh, construction trade school students and government officials in other parts of China before the next earthquake strikes. And in Haiti, we're just ramping up to do the same exact thing, builders training, hands-on technical assistance, and working in partnership with the Ministry of Public Works in order to develop some interim standards for safe construction. So we hope to improve about 50,000 houses in Indonesia and China and Haiti in the next year. Um, we occasionally have opportunities for interns, um, so if anyone's interested in talking about that, please get in touch with me. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions.
Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Why? Well, in Indonesia, because that's, it's not common to have a roof diaphragm, right? The roof is, is a timber frame. And so in China, actually, we do use the roof diaphragm because those, those buildings have a reinforced concrete slab roof. Um, so it's basically just kind of trying to make things work with the existing architecture. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. According to our structural engineers, yes. <laughs> Although I think it adds some, I think it adds a little bit of bracing, but it's not enough to, I think, really justify in the analysis. And you know, the other thing is, like, you look at these buildings that have heavy reinforced concrete slab roofs that could act as a diaphragm and a weak wall, and they they collapse. I mean, that's the massive numbers of buildings collapsed for that reason in Haiti, because the wall system wasn't very strong. The roof was just fine, but it was very heavy. So there's a larger demand on the wall. The wall just came out from under the roof slab. Yeah, they, the wall, they collapsed in shear. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Um, so the question is whether or not there are adobe structures in China and Indonesia. Not in Indonesia. Um, in China, definitely in some of the very, very rural areas that we've worked, they have very thick-walled adobe buildings. But when we talk to homeowners about um, building a new house, they all want to build a more modern confined masonry building. So we haven't really been advocating to build out of earth. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. This question is about my, my dissertation research, which, which is on ground improvement uh, to prevent liquefaction. Um, and we were, we're looking at single-story buildings. And so the, the soil issues are less important than, than they were in the, in the buildings that I was looking at for my dissertation, where you definitely need to improve the ground. And what I looked at in my dissertation was how deep and how wide do you need to, to improve the ground in order to keep your settlement. Um, into a tolerable level. So we ended up looking at, basically looking at, well, if you can avoid liquefiable sands and if you can avoid very expansive clays, then you're all right. And so we developed some very simple screening techniques to screen out those systems. Now, it was rare in the, in the projects that we've worked in so far that we've actually found those soils, although we have found them in a few cases. And so in that case, our first recommendation to the homeowner is to move, but that doesn't work very well, <laughs> usually. And so then our second recommendation is to dig out the expansive clays. We've had some situations where there's been like a meter or so of clay that we just didn't like, and we were able to dig it out and replace it. Um, and then the next recommendation, if we can't get those two done is to build out of timber, right? Is to avoid the, avoid a masonry building um, because the timber is going to be a little bit more tolerable to the settlements and it'll be easier to repair if it does settle and it's lighter weight. Um, but it's, a t it's definitely a tough one and we're trying not to ignore the geotech, you know, because that's my background. But, um, but definitely the, I haven't seen I haven't seen a lot of houses, single-story masonry houses, that have failed because of the foundation. It's more the walls and the reinforced tie column bond beam connection. Yeah. Yeah, so the, qu the question is about um, most of our work has been in the post-earthquake environment and are we um, 
planning to or have we done any work in, in pre-earthquake mitigation. And that's kind of how we're transitioning now in China. So our plan is to move into a country after the disaster because there's a huge need. There's funding. There's an opportunity. We can use that to build our own capacity, our own, our own set of resources. But then the idea is that we then, once the reconstruction is finished, take those resources to other parts of the country um, where earthquakes are likely. I mean, the, build, the structural system is the same. The language is the same. And so that's what we're transitioning to do in China. We haven't been able to make that transition in Indonesia because earthquakes just keep happening. And on January 11th, we had a board meeting in which we discussed what Bill Change's third country was going to be in 2010. And, and we're talking about um, a peri-urban area of a South American city that, that was highly seismically active but hadn't had an earthquake yet. Very excited about the possibility of moving into that context. That was January 11th. The Haiti earthquake was January 12th. So that changed our trajectory, trajectory. But I do hope as we continue to grow that we're able to move into working in environments before earthquake strikes. Yeah. Yeah. In that context, is it going to be practical to provide a simple set of guidance for retrofitting buildings in advance? Yeah. Very good question. I should have talked about that. The, the, the question is about retrofitting um, and practical guidelines for retrofitting. Yes, I think so. Um, there is a repair guideline that has been made in Haiti, um, mostly by Miyamoto International. And we're now working with Miyamoto and with some other engineering companies to come up with a simple retrofitting guideline. And I really do think we can distill that down into the six or eight simple things that you need to do, as long as you have kind of the same type of structure and the same type of failure over. So I think that's possible. We've only just started to work on that, though. So if you're interested in helping, let me know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I haven't seen very much of the internally reinforced concrete blocks that we do here. Mm -hmm. Um, I think reinforced masonry is viable, um, viable from an engineering standpoint. In Haiti, the concrete blocks are usually cellular, um, so they're not hollow all the way through. So you do have to, if you're a builder, you have to bash a hole in one, one side of the concrete block in order to get a hollow one, right? So that's one thing. Um, the other issue is that I'm not, we're going to, to experiment with this. I mean, we're designing a reinforced masonry house, but whether it would be easier to convince someone to improve to reinforced masonry or to improve to confined masonry is a real question. Because either way, you've got to make some change. You know, you've got to get your steel in the foundation before you start building the, the block wall, right? And you now that's going to be a change. And so we're going to look at this, but I'm not sure it's going to be any easier um, to get people to build reinforced masonry than it is to get people to build um, better confined masonry. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, in, in Haiti, are you looking at all of the, the construction of the Vito Bill, or are you just considering that part of the bigger picture? Um, the question is about, I'm not sure I understand. The question, because the Vito Bill construction is more unreinforced masonry, well, or? Uh, are you seeing it as a separate challenge, or is that just part of the continuum of challenges? Ah, yeah. So the question is about, whether or not we're dealing with the, the Bidonville construction any differently than any other part, and we're not really. Um, a lot of the, in the areas that I've been in, they've been, there have been a lot of unreinforced masonry and a lot of kind of partially confined, poorly done confined masonry, and so we're dealing mainly with those, with those areas. For, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. Um, Huh. Very good question. So the question is about um, what type of performance the homeowners expect. So what we're trying to get is preventing all or part of the house from collapsing. And so what we share with them is a minimum standard that will prevent all or part of the house from collapsing. And we say, well, if you want your house to be usable, I mean, if you build according to this, it might be cracked and you might not be able to use it again. Um, so if you want a higher standard, we can give you that, but a lot of homeowners, we've rarely found a homeowner who is able to build to that standard. So this helps us convince people 
um, especially in Indonesia where the, there is this option of building a timber frame building. Um, we use this as part of our argument towards, well, if you build a timber frame, you'll probably be able to live in your house afterward, no problem. You may have to repair a few things, but it'll be livable. But if you don't build your confined masonry right, it could collapse and, and it could and injure you. But the thing is, though, about that, and I'd love to talk to you about this more, is that how do we get to this performance criteria with common structural engineering analysis? That's something I don't know. I don't know how to do. So, again, why we need some experimental research and some more engineering thought put into this. How, how receptive are the local contractors to having these education programs? Are they resistant, or are they hopeful, <laughs> or are they selling their new technology as some value-added uh, capability? Ha, yeah, how, how resistant or open are the, are the contractors to um, training? Well, it depends. Um, sometimes they're not open because we slow them down and cost them more money. Um, so, but if the homeowner says, I'm not going to pay you unless you follow this, that helps. If the government says, um, you need to follow these rules. And if we can say, well, actually, in China, we were able to say, this is the Chinese standard. This is not a foreign standard. This is your standard. So um, it depends on if there are extra carrots and sticks in place that makes it a whole lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, okay, so the question is whether is, is regarding use of lightweight roofs in Haiti and um, if we're designing for hurricanes. And we're actually not really introducing them. There are some simple timber roofs that are already common. Like in the Bidonvilles, there are it's a single story unreinforced masonry with a with a very simple timber roof. It's already common. So we're not really introducing it. We're we're promoting it because people are looking for an alternative to the heavy roof. Um, and we're looking at where the, the engineering design is for seismic and wind loads. And so emphasizing to tie the roof down, I think, is one of the most important design features that's going to come out of that analysis. Yeah? And with the training, are you offering any kind of certification? We'd like to do that um, in partnership with the Ministry of Public Works. So, so far, they've been in the position to kind of certify the assessments that have been done. And what we'd like is for them to kind of certify us, to certify other people, um, so that we can definitely add to the capacity that they, they might not be able to train everyone who needs to be trained. So we're hoping to work in partnership with the government to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I'm, I'm going to cut it off right now uh, because uh, people may have other commitments, but Elizabeth's going to be here for... Uh, uh, further questions if people have questions. So thank you very much for a very inspiring presentation. Thank you.